Yeah. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everybody. 8:30. We're live. So it's Saturday morning here in sunny, beautiful Florida. Uh, trying to do something a little bit different in the face of what we've all been dealing with, which is a lot of adversity. So we're seeing some sprinkling of car shows starting to show up. We've all lived through 2020, where most of our car events have been canceled and our car lives have been effectively ruined. Uh, as the COVID kind of subsided a bit, a couple of events popped up and here we are now, uh, November, uh, right around the holiday time and it seems to be flaring up again and we're all getting shut down again. A um, good friend of mine, Michael Cohen from the local British Car Club, from the Gold Coast British Car Club, had a suggestion a couple of weeks ago. Uh, since we can't all get together, now here in South Florida, the weather has turned. It is beautiful out and this is the time when we all come out and do our events. So for the folks that are tuning in from cold parts of the, of the country, um, come to sunny, warm Florida. It's beautiful out. 78 degrees with a cool ocean breeze coming in today. Um, we would normally be having cars and coffees right now. We would normally be having gatherings and get-togethers. And uh, we kind of are what we're kind of not. So what can we do to help cut through some of the doldrums, get our car community together, share some love, and spread some Florida warmth? Uh, well, I guess this is 2020. We go virtual. So here we are on a Zoom in front of our incredible old barn uh, having a virtual car tour, a shop tour. So Michael uh, invited a couple of his friends from the Gold Coast Car Club, uh, just a couple, just to kind of come with us. I have a couple of guys in the shop working. I'll explain what they're doing here in a minute. I'm going to bring everybody for a walking tour of our facility and specifically I'm going to talk about a couple of the cars that we're working on, which I hope is going to excite people. Um, if you were able to read a little bit of the background, we've got some pretty extraordinary projects here. Uh, what's exciting about those projects? Well, it depends upon what side you're looking at. Is it exciting or is it stressful? We've got very specific deadlines. So we have a car that we're finishing for Cavallino, uh, the Ferrari event here in Palm Beach, which is uh, the end of January. We have uh, Aston Martin we're finishing for Amelia Island Concorde d'Elegance um, and several other cars which we're prepping to go uh, to those events as well, as well as events starting for the rest of the year. Uh, we're going to go inside right now. We're going to give this thing a shot. But as you can also hear from the noise that just got generated in the background, please understand this is live. We're winging this. We're having some fun with our car friends. So excuse some of the wires, some of the noises, maybe a glitch or two, um, uh, and just kind of come with us and have some fun. Michael, you want to come over here and just quickly say hello? So this is Michael Cohen. In so many ways, he's got a lot of titles. He's done things in the car community for years and years and years. So he's been the president, the vice president, the treasurer, the social director. But more importantly, he just loves this and loves gathering people together and refuses to give up. So when there's an opportunity to do a rally, to do a car show, to gather people together, Michael is at the center of that. And that's how this all got started. Hey, Jason, what do you think about and here we are today, and let's go have some fun. So, Michael, thank you very much. Thank you. We're honored to be able to do this. Uh, we're happy that uh, I think we have uh, nine or ten uh, British car clubs across the nation um, working with uh, Marquee News that have uh, yep. uh, agreed to tap in. So we hope you guys enjoy our weather. We hope you guys enjoy the tours, and let's go see let's some go. cars. All right, come on. So as we kind of come into the shop, I'm going to be very brief about the general tour because I really want to focus on cars. But as you walk through, I'm just going to give you a little bit of background so you know where you are. Uh, this is, again, the Creative Workshop. We're in Dania Beach, Florida, which is basically a suburb of Fort Lauderdale. It's a city, but it's connected. This barn is 100 years old or approximately. It was built in uh, the early 30s, getting there. And um, it was originally a granary. It's been converted to a comprehensive restoration and coach building facility, and you'll see not only the, the original charm, but also all of the incredible equipment and all the tools we use to build cars around. Uh, uh, it's a pretty special place. Certainly, there are moments where the building creates some adversity, but at the same time, as I think I, and I hope you'll see, having these incredible cars on these Dade County Pine wood floors, the charm and the soul of it all just adds... Um, I really do think it brings warmth to the cars that we build. And we've been very privileged and fortunate that the cars that we've built have been to some of the biggest events in the world. Pebble, Amelia, Miglia, Villa de Esle Como, and all of the wonderful events that are in between. Greenwich and Wheels and Keels and Keeneland and Hilton Head and, and whatnot. So uh, we really take that privilege very seriously. Uh, our clients trusting us with these incredible cars, this incredible building which houses our work 
and our ability to bring it out to people out there. So come on inside. You can see around us the library and this incredible little place. That is Tony, our shop manager, who was here helping keep down the fort here on this lo lovely Saturday. Casper is one of our mechanics. He's been here working uh, in the background, uh, getting ready for some of the builds we're doing right now. We're going to start right here. As we walk into the shop, I, it's probably hard to miss uh, the Giallo Yellow, Fly Yellow uh, Ferrari. This Ferrari Daytona is in 1971, and the leg sticking out is Nate? Nope, Morrison. Morrison. Morrison is underneath there. Uh, for anybody who is logging in that might have watched the show that was done about us through Motor Trend, we were embedded, we had a film crew embedded with us uh, that was on Motor Trend called Long Road to Monterey. Morrison was with us as we were building the Kissel, which actually it was yellow as well, totally different yellow, um, and uh, ended up at Pebble Beach. Uh, lots and lots of fun. Ironically, just to give some props out, the guys who are behind the camera right now are, is the actual film crew that was with us, embedded with us for Long, Long Road to Monterey. So, they're used to us, they're used to this environment, and they lived through a lot of this chaos with us as we were getting these cars ready. This car, in its, con its in configuration, will be on the field of Cavallino uh, January, the last weekend of January. That's Saturday, January 30th, I believe it is. Uh, so if the first reaction is, oh my goodness, how in the world is that going to happen? Um, well, that's when the magic happens. You do an incredible amount of prep work. You plan, you plot. You diagnose, you research, you dial this in. This is forensic restoration. Uh, when we build cars that go to the major events, and especially something as uh, wonderful as a, as a Daytona, every single nut, bolt, and screw has been researched. So it's been planned, and now it's being executed. And every single day, we are bolting things onto this car and reconfiguring things on this car for perfection. Uh, yesterday, which you missed, we were thinking it might happen this morning, but we don't have the time to delay. We put this wonderful Colombo V12 into this car. Uh, of all the engines we've put into cars, this one is mildly difficult. Uh, Jaguar E-types are extraordinarily difficult. Putting the engine into the back of that Countach, which we did about a week ago, is unbelievably difficult. But this one, it's more sixteenths of an inch of time as we slowly bring this wonderful um, uh, engine into place. Uh, as you can see, the components are starting to be built around it. The brake boosters, the wiring harnesses are going in, the cooling fans, the pedal assemblies. We now have brakes. The tires and the wheels are obviously old. We're putting them on there just for stability. But if you can focus in there, which I'm sure one of our guys will do, you can start to see some of the incredible detail that's happening with the suspension and the nickel plating. It is absolutely a thing of beauty. One of the things that we're always challenged with when restoring cars, and this is Blue, this is our shop dog over here, he's going to say hello and kind of intercede whenever we can, uh, is the balance between restoration and originality. Uh, these cars, when they were built, and this is representative of a lot of the cars you'll see here, there's a certain crudeness to them. Uh, they were hand-built. Believe it or not, when they were originally built, they weren't meant to be these incredible, iconic supercars. They are meant to be sports cars or to be driven or to go onto the track. So there was a certain level of crudeness that was built into these things. And as restorers, we have to walk a pretty fine line. Somewhere between perfection and homaging the beauty of the car and respecting its place in history, and at the same time, also being true to its originality and the handcrafted nature that these vehicles exhibited. So there are things like crude fiberglass and, and believe it or not, imbalances in the way lights might be sometimes or how things open and close. Uh, that we have to leave, um, the, the texture in the fiberglass and, and whatnot, that's correct for the car, but still making these cars perfect from a, again, as a respect to the vehicle's um, place in our history. Made about 1,400 of these vehicles total, and as you probably know if you're a Ferrari guy, these are 365 GTBs, and in America, we tend to call them Daytonas, uh, honored after the 67 or 68, a 1-2-3 win at Daytona, 24 hours, um, and then these cars were affectionately nicknamed that, even though Ferrari kind of unofficially does not call it that. We all here call it Daytona. Uh, so you're going to see this, more of it, especially through Instagram, um, as we post pictures of this car getting finished for um, completion. Uh, let's see here, turning our sights to that way. This is another car that we're getting ready for Amelia Island. You'll see this at the Amelia Island Concorde d'Elegance. Remarkable piece of machinery. This is a Cooper Bobtail T39, 1955, owned by one of our wonderful friends and clients, Rob Adams and Leah. Uh, 
it's, it's a milestone car. For folks who know the brand, who know Cooper, this is a Cooper race car, father and son team that revolutionized racing back in the 50s. The, you know, especially with the proliferation of some movies now, like Rush and especially Ford versus Ferrari, you have to understand how important these cars were back in history. The, the connection between the names that, you're pe that people are starting to understand, we're all involved in this. The engineering, the, the legacies that these cars created spread throughout racing out in throughout Europe and here in America. And as we all define them, the golden age of racing, you're looking at some of the absolute milestone cars that proliferated through the racing community. In this instance, this is rear engine design. The first car, race car, to put an engine behind the race driver. The reason why this happened was after World War II, the father-son team started to build race cars, and they didn't have a lot of parts available to them. If it wasn't bombed out, they were recycling parts from all around the countryside. And because of the nature of the parts they're able to find, they were forced into putting the engine behind them because the transmission they found had to be mounted from the rear. What they didn't realize was that it was an incredibly efficient and race-ready design. And from this point in time, no other successful race car has been built without an engine behind the race car driver. This is a milestone race car car. They built about 50 uh, T39 bobtails. Uh, this particular car was owned by Sir Jack Brabham. If you don't know who that is, look him up. This is one of the most famous names in British racing you'll ever find. And own this car, race this car, and with the Cooper Bobtail, won numerous Formula One uh, uh, championships. So this is an incredibly famous car, an historic car, and a milestone car that if you're planning on being at Amelia Island, will be there in all of its glory and there for you guys to take a look at. Incredible piece of machinery. Uh, kind of popping through here, coming around to the other side. And if you want to just pan up really quickly, so one of the things I love about this place is we attract really remarkable cars from all over, from all over the world. Uh, we're not just European sports car guys, we're not just Concord guys, but we're car lovers. And as long as our clients have the same mentality, it's about the car and it's about where it goes, and especially when it connects with family and history of that family, we're all in. In this instance, you're looking at a 1965 Lincoln Continental. Um, it is a wonderful car and a wonderful kind of piece of family history. Uh, you might have seen the car recently in Vogue magazine, and then they kind of went viral, and now from Vogue, it's been in Fox and in magazines everywhere. This is the car that Eunice Shriver got married in. This has been in the Shriver Kennedy family since new, gifted down the line, and every single family event has happened in this car, which, again, gives me goosebumps to know how important this car was to that family. It was brought to us in extraordinarily precarious shape, condition, on the edge of folding in on itself. We saved her, finished it the night before. Tony, who you met, shop manager, drove it down to the wedding through torrential downpours. The weather parted, the family got in the car, the daughter got married. We have pictures of the entire wedding party in the car, sitting up on the, on the, um, the, the convertible top assembly that we folded down in there. And, uh, the car came back and now we're kind of just cleaning her up and getting her ready to go back to the family for good. So that's a wonderful sort of heartfelt thing where we were able to participate uh, with that wedding in even the smallest of ways, which again, you can see everywhere online now with the family driving it around. Uh, coming through the shop right here, there's another incredible car that we're getting ready for Amelia Island. So this car, I'm proud to say, we're gonna be unveiling at Amelia Island. This is another example of a car being saved. When it was bought, it was basically in a warehouse, rotting away, and when they only made 1,700 of these, approximately, um, there's not a lot of these left, and uh, this was this close to being another car lost. So covered in multiple layers of paint and Bondo and fiberglass and crap, underneath it was rotting metal. Uh, this is a superleggera body. Uh, if you're not familiar with that term, superleggera is a touring coach builder term uh, meaning aluminum super light, where they take aluminum and they stretch it around a wireframe. The, the interaction between the aluminum skin and the steel infrastructure creates galvanic reaction and it rots and it rusts. Uh, we have a DB4, which I'm gonna show you, that the way that they tried to combat that was to put linen between the aluminum and the steel. And anyone who's a car guy knows you put cloth between two metal panels, it basically creates a sponge and it rots everything out. So. This car, everything was rotted, everything was rusting, it was falling apart. Now you see this thing in completely metal worked, hammered out, body worked, painted, beautiful condition, 
and we're in the process of assembling it. This car will be unveiled at Amelia Island, and it's been accepted to Quail, so we're unveiling at her at Amelia Island, and then the next time you'll see her out of Monterey Peninsula, out at the Quail, for one of my favorite events, the greatest car garden party the world has ever seen. So, uh, from a Aston Martin perspective, the DB6 is considered to be one of the most beautiful Grand Tours ever built. It is the end of the famous line of the four, five, and six, the five being the most famous because of James Bond, the four being the one which basically introduced David Brown's style of car to the world. It was the first modern Aston Martin, and we'll show you one of those downstairs. Uh, kind of walking through the place just quickly up there um, is a one-off Maserati that was born in 1964 as a 3500, rebodied in South Africa to go club racing. It was lost, found, lost, found, and we spent years trying to find scraps of paper to understand who built the car. Remarkable piece of coach building. Uh, as far as we know right now, it was done by a private coach builder somewhere in South Africa for hire to go racing with. And if you look at it, it's remarkable because if you split the car in half, the butt of the car looks like Aston Martin Zagato. The front of the car looks like Pininfarina Ferrari. And they grafted these two styles and designs together to create this one-off car. I find it strikingly beautiful, and uh, we're very close to having that finished. And from what I understand, the client, well, the client lives in the UK. You'll see this at Silverstone next year. Coming through the shop, we've got all sorts of fun stuff here. So we have hot rods and American muscle and customs. Uh, peeking out of the corner over here to the left is a Lamborghini 400 GT. Uh, the theme of tractor to car, I think, is pretty strong here today. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows this, but David Brown, the founder of, or not the founder, but the, the, uh, uh, the, the main muse for the Aston Martin company, created his wealth from his tractor company, used that to buy Aston Martin, and then create the DB line. Lamborghini, I'm sure many people at this point know this, was a tractor company. And famously, very truncating the, truncating the story extremely, he went to Ferrari, wanted him to build him a car. Ferrari said no. He said, well, if you're not going to build me a car, I'm going to go build my own cars. Converted his Lamborghini com tractor company into a sports car company. And the very first car they built was the 350. They built very few of those. It almost is identical to the 400. So this is basically a very slight continuation adaptation of the very beginning of the company. And this is the beginning of the Lamborghini company that we all now know for building some of the most remarkable carbon fiber supercars on the planet Earth. Many people believe that this is probably one of the finest, um, again, tours uh, of all time. Absolutely beautifully stunning car with a V12 uh, uh, front mounted rear axle uh, Lamborghini uh, uh, engine transmission combination. Amazingly so, this car as well is going to Amelia Island. From my perspective and talking to the folks who run the event, this is a very important moment sort of in car history. This is a 1994 Toyota Supra JDM, right-hand drive, Mark IV. Uh, for folks who are deep into the Concours world, into the classic car world, the first reaction might be is why is a car, a modern car, a more modern car going to um, uh, a Concours d'Elegance, which tends to skew a little bit older uh, in terms of the cars. Well, this is, a, this is a moment in time where car communities are coming together, where we're all getting a little bit older, and the younger guys who have a passion and association with these cars uh, need a place. And I think it is a brilliant and bold and exciting move uh, for Amelia to welcome and acknowledge this style of car onto their show field. The fascinating story behind this. So for the older group out there, we all grew up hot rodding and working on cars and tweaking in our driveway, and especially for the older, older group, thinking about 1950s, like Los Angeles and, 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 and salt flat races and whatnot, uh, salvaging from the junkyard and building hot rods. Well, for the new generation, they didn't have that. So they would get their Hondas and, and their Mazdas and their Toyotas and their Nissans, and they would start to do what they could to that. Uh, and, uh, we all kind of looked at that odd. You know, we all remember the sound of the coffee can exhaust and what to do. They put the cat back exhaust and you hear that weird sound and that's not real car stuff. They didn't have a place. They were kind of stuck in the middle. What we didn't know was that in Japan, th there was a, an underground illegal race group called Midnight Racers and they would take their Japanese cars and they would modify them extensively. At that time, Japan regulated the speed nationally to 112 miles an hour. If you had a car, you could not go faster than 112 miles an hour. 
So this midnight racing group would heavily modify their cars to go faster than that. And they would set up these roadblocks so that they can police out where the authorities were so they can bring these cars to 200 miles an hour. This illegal, underground, secretive racing community was discovered by Hollywood, as Hollywood does, and we know it as the Fast and Furious franchise. So the Fast and Furious movie came out as a story to tell about this illegal underground midnight racing group. When Fast and Furious came out, it created this environment where these cars were now accepted. So if you look at this car right now, this is the milestone car that the midnight racers would race with, that the Fast and Furious franchise capitalized on, that gave a place to our modern kids and their ability to work and tune these cars. And now we're going to be acknowledging that moment in history, in our car culture and history, at Amelia Island in March with this vehicle right here. This is a JDF. Yep. Yeah. My first sports car was a 78 280Z. Probably one of the best cars I ever owned. 100,000 miles. <laughs> the, only thing I, the only thing I replaced was a slave cylinder for the clutch. That was it. So. When you think about some of these cars, the 242, 6280, the GTRs, right, the Mazdas, right, you're getting as, as the president of the Mazda Miata Club, right, um, uh, the, the, the Mitsubishi 3000 GTs, this whole community of cars, they were incredible, they were kitsch, they were iconic, but they were kind of sidelined. Yeah. And because of the Fast and Furious franchise, it became mainstream. Loud and proud, here we come. And now, 1,200 horsepower out of this engine is going into this car, and that is you know, the turbos and the engines and the horsepower and all the cool stuff that we all know that we love about these cars, there's no reason to be ashamed of it anymore. This is true car building, this is true hot rodding, this is true culture, and here we are ready to embrace it. And that straight six was Bullet. just on bulletproof. And McCooney, only... McCooney side dress? Yes. Probably. McCooney side dress, right? Yes. It, was, it was fuel injected. It was fuel, fuel injected. It was, it was fuel late injected. enough for fuel injected. Yeah, and uh, also you go from, from second to third, from third to fifth, because Third, 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 third to gear, you're doing 90 miles an hour. I love the torque of a well-built six-cylinder engine. Like think about Jaguar E-types as well. They just, they have such a lovely pull to them. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Oh. As a fellow hot rodder, I was always impressed with the Japanese cars because they would do like 1,200 horsepower with the stock crank. <laughs> and in an American car, you, you, the first thing you did was go to a forged crank yeah. if you were gonna build a performance engine. And these youngsters were doing <laughs> all of this horsepower modification, but leaving the bottom end stock. If we respect engineering and technology, it's a shame if we don't acknowledge what is happening overseas and what is happening here with these incredible cars. It's, it is, again, true car building. It is true engineering. It is true thoughtful. I want to make my car better, better cooler, faster, all the things that we did. Essence of hot rod. All, essence of hot rodding. All the things that we did with 327s and 350s and 351s and 302s and 333s and all this other fun stuff, right? I and mean, we can go old, 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 old. I mean, I can go back to, you know, we build brass our cars here with side open valves, you know, oilers, you know, with the exposed valve train. So um, there's not a period of time. It's funny, I'm, I'm friends with uh, uh, Diane Parker, who's the head of the HVA. And they just announced what they're, the, from some of the first cars they're initiating into the um, Library of Congress for the hot rod community. And they had the very first Duesenberg ever built for the public. Uh, it's a race car. They took, was Duesenberg was built on their racing heritage and they weren't really a consumer brand. And there was a point in time where they said, let's give this a go. So they basically took all their racing knowledge, all their racing components, took it and put it into a car, not a race car. And uh, that car is now being admitted into the Library of Congress. But in essence, it's a hot rod Duesenberg. So, you know, everything old is new again. We think that what we're doing is so special and so new. There were hot rodding cars, the Vanderbilt racers. And the, you know, think about it. It just goes on and on and on. Here we are just riding on the history and the foundation that was built by our forefathers. Come on, let's go back down. So if you kind of get a feel for the shop, Upstairs is where we, we do disassembly and assembly, and then we separate it with these gates that go downstairs where we do all the dirty work, all the metal fabrication, all the body work, all the painting. Um, you're gonna see what these cars painted look like when we're going through the process. Can you give us a quick synopsis? You have an MGB sitting up here. Oh yeah. So, you know, we really love working with cars, and certainly, um, 
certainly um, our capabilities allow us to work on some pretty exotic and special and unique vehicles. But when someone is in need and they feel that they don't have an appropriate place to go because they don't trust someone to work on their beloved car and there's family history and they respect and love their car, anyone's welcome here. And this is a wonderful story of a person who bought this car, knows who we were, really wanted the right type of people working on their vehicle. And yeah, it's a rubber bumper MGB and I'm proud to have it here. Okay, not even a chrome bumper. So all of you, again, younger MGB guys. Um, it's a limited edition. It's a limited edition though. So um, I'm a Sunbeam Alpine driver. I, I was gonna drive here this morning, I just didn't trust the Florida weather. So um, to me, it's the soul of the client and the intention behind the car, which, which we work off of. Not necessarily the value of the car, albeit, obviously, as you can tell, we have a lot of zeros behind a lot of the cars here, but. It's a wonderful, charming project for a really wonderful family, and uh, we're in the process of resurrecting it from storage for a long time. We've done some engine work, we've done suspension work, brakes, making it safe and reliable so they can enjoy their MGB, just like this gentleman here can enjoy his Lamborghini. Did you ever, did you ever get the horsepower off of your car? I remember <laughs> years ago I was here and you had it on the dyno. <laughs> it's and, still at and, the bottom. And you were disappointed that your horsepower was all right. It's still at the bottom. Yes, we did. As a matter of fact, we rejetted it and uh, rephased the distributors, and um, I think we got another 10 out of it, which is big, you know, when you think about it, but I'm still at the bottom, and I'm okay with that. We got some big numbers on the dyno board, so for me to be at the bottom, I'll take my lumps, and I'll enjoy my car. Yeah. All right, come on, guys. Excuse me, Blue. So coming downstairs, this is our metal and body area, and you can see over here in the corner is the beautiful alloy body from the DB4. Um, all of, the, the, all of the, uh, uh, the markings that you see on the body. So this is, a, this is a classic story. Car comes to us and it's, unfortunately it's in boxes. And so the parts are strewn everywhere. And every single panel on the car is dented, has had welds on it. It looks like someone took the car, rolled it down a cliff, just tried to straighten out the tin foil and smash it and then weld some stuff on it. Um, that's not the way you treat a D before, okay? Uh, so what you see is the beginnings of us. Well, we're actually maybe more like halfway through the reforming and the shaping of the body. Again, this is super legera. This is an aluminum skin wrapped around a steel framework. And so we've already had the entire back half of the car removed that all the metalwork on and now have reattached it to the framework. Uh, there was structural damage where the alloys were intermixing galvanic reaction and rusting through. So we're done with the structural repairs. We are done shaping and forming and doing repairs on the front. We're now actually going in and working. You can see how this is not open. We had to rebuild this section over here. That section was better. And now we're working in the grill area, straightening all this stuff out. I mentioned before about the galvanic reaction. Um, you can see, excuse me, pup. You can see where we have the linen. That's the way it was built originally, which separates the two alloys. Now, from an originality perspective, the linen is there as originally built. From a modern car building perspective, from a client perspective, we have coatings, modern epoxy coatings, on the inside and the outside to protect against galvanic reaction. So when we wrap the aluminum back around the steel, even if this does get a little bit of waterlogged, we still have a, a coatings, which is gonna make sure these two alloys don't interact. Uh, improperly. You can also notice that we have bars set up over here. The structure of this vehicle was so compromised when we started to work on it that we couldn't risk having the car move on us. So we set the gaps, locked in a bar, and now can remove sections of the car without risk of the car moving on us. So this is all stuff that we do to ensure that the integrity of the vehicle is maintained. Uh, this car um, is scheduled to be complete by August of next year, and uh, we will be submitting her to Pebble Beach. Uh, whether or not she gets in, it's the most difficult show on the planet Earth to get into, and it is a carryover year since Pebble was canceled in August. Uh, uh, pretty much everyone who got accepted last August is gonna be going this August, so it's gonna be limited edition, so uh, a, a new additions to the field. So I don't know whether or not she's gonna get in or not, but we're gonna have her ready for it, hoping that she will get in there. So maybe we'll see you on the field at Pebble Beach with this beautiful piece of machinery. Pulling back, and going by. We've got a wonderful Porsche 930 uh, turbo. And then behind that, which we're obviously, we just finished stripping and putting into a ceiling. We're gonna have to, uh, a ceiling primer. We have a lot of metal work to do on her. Coming over here to a, and this is one of the more underdog cars out there. This is a Mercedes-Benz 3.5 Cabriolet. This is the one with the V8. 
Uh, very, very limited uh, production, very few left. They all tend to rot and rust. So the few that were built, I think 1,700, I know for a fact there's less than half left. I think there's actually more like a quarter left. Uh, there's been several that have been chopped, and what ends up happening is, is the water gets in here. Back then, they weren't that good with water prevention and rust proofing, so they all rot out in here, and people don't know how to save them. Uh, so this is a very, very special car, very valuable car. Back then, this was Mercedes-Benz's flagship um, uh, luxury vehicle that they produced to go against things like Rolls-Royce and Bentley, and uh, was one of the most uh, costly and sought after vehicles back then, 68 to 73, 69 to 73. This is a 71, 71, okay? We just did a car rotation yesterday, so this empty spot, which is now in the booth, was occupied by a Porsche 914-6, which for the Porsche guys that are out there, uh, is finally coming into its own. Uh, the 914-6 was one of these remarkable cars that seemed to be forgotten about because everybody was a 911 or a 356 guy, and all of a sudden someone realized, wait a minute, 914-6s have unbelievable race history. These were iconic vehicles that were banged and thrashed all over racetracks, all over the country, all over the world, and all of a sudden they're being restored, values are going up, the car community writes itself. So we're in the process of a forensic restoration for one of our great clients on that 914-6. Not sure, do, do, do we have intention of where we're gonna be showing her? Or right now we're getting it done, we'll deal with it when we're done. So we'll talk about maybe another one of these where we're going to be unveiling that car when we're done with her. Do you have a full-time person just responsible for moving the cars around the shop? <laughs> because I would volunteer. <laughs> no, you, you don't want to do that when they're down here. Car rotations are a little hairy sometimes. You know, we have to plot and plan. Part because half the cars are on wheels, half the cars are on carts, half the cars are not rolling at all. And then you got the complexities of the building with ramps and one or two egress points. So it's an art form, without a doubt. So. Uh, the next one we do, maybe we'll invite everyone over and we can watch us move, push cars around. Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny. Get more people, that's always good. The, the cat, right, exactly. And, and, and two dogs, by the way. Uh, the, the camera guys were here yesterday, yesterday getting prepped. And uh, I saw one of them film the Lamborghini Countach being backed out. And I was looking at it from a, an outsider's perspective. And I was like, they must think we're nuts. Because you've got this Countach with this crazy 12-cylinder engine making turns. And we're so used to this right now. So you'll have guys, point guys, and you'll back it up every inch to within, you can put a hand between its stopping point. To a lay person looking at that, you're thinking, are these guys out of their minds? Like what happens if something goes wrong? From my perspective, we do this every single day. So to us, it's like a surgeon, like they're about to, like, I don't want to cut into someone's brain, right? So, but they do it all day long. So we're moving this Countach around by sixteenths of an inch to go in, out, back, and out. Perhaps you could do a uh, nationwide challenge of puzzles. Everybody on the map, too. This is what has to be. The end result, this is where they have to be. How would you do it? Like car Jenga. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something like that. Come on. Yeah. Okay. So coming outside, and this is in essence sort of like the end of our tour, and these are the end of the vehicles that we're going to be restoring for major events. So you kind of get a feel for what we're up against here. Oh, my goodness, we have the Lotus. We'll end up upstairs in the dino room, okay? So looking out here, this is sort of our staging area to go into the booth. This is where we do color sanding and pre-prep work, okay? Uh, We'll focus on this car first, which is maybe right now one of my favorite stories in the shop. Uh, the, the names that are associated with what you're looking at right now is absolutely astronomical. Most people won't even know what this is. So I'm gonna introduce you to the Allied Swallow. This is part of the forgotten fiberglass world. A good friend of mine, Jeffrey Hacker, who is the champion of the forgotten fiberglass world. He knows the car, knows of these cars. Porsche, yep. Prime, awesome. Um, so check out these names, George Barris, Rob Peterson, Mickey Thompson, Billy Burke. For people who know, we're talking about old hot rodders, these are legends, and obviously Peterson is a legend and the name continues forward. Barris is a legend, the name continues forward. Billy Burke, basically the founder of the Belly Tank Racer. Mickey Thompson, one of the most famous race car drivers, speed guys out there, from the Baja to Speed Trials to the Tire Company. Uh, here's the story behind this incredible piece of machinery here. It's 1950s, early 50s. Uh, in 47, the Chiz Italia 202 came out, one of the most iconic sports cars of all time. Uh, so famous in its design that the MoMA brought one of the Chiz Italias and brought it on display permanently in the MoMA Museum, okay? It's one of the icons of modern sports car design. 
Fast forward a couple of years, and Rob Peterson, knowing about the Chis Italia launch in 47, purchases and acquires one of these Chis Italias and says, I want to bring one of these to the 51 or 52, I think it was, Peterson Motorama back in California. So he sends out a bunch of guys, picks up this Chis Italia, buys it, and brings it down. And on the way down, gets himself into a little bit of trouble. You know, they got to get it peed up. I, if I remember the story correctly, I think they drove the Chis Italia from the East Coast to the West Coast to get it to California for the Motorama. So think about this. This is 5051 in an Italian sports car that no one has ever seen with no technology that exists really in America. So Weber carburetors were not existent in America right now. There's no Napa's. There's barely an interstate road system. And they drive this thing across. So you can imagine it got there, unbelievable feat of car driving, right? Great American race kind of stuff. And it needed a lot of work. So Peterson calls up his good friend George Barris and says, hey, can you get my car in there? We gotta get cleaned up for the Motorama. The car goes into the shop. Word gets out that this crazy Italian sports car is in California, and Peterson has something to do with it, and it's at Barris' shop. So I guess word gets to Mickey Thompson. Mickey Thompson calls up Billy Burke, and they go to Barris without Peterson knowing and take a mold off of the original Chis Italia. That mold ultimately became the Allied Swallow. They built 25 bodies off of Rob Peterson's Chis Italia 202. One of those Allied Swallow bodies cars was found and brought to Pebble Beach last year. And to this right now at the Peterson Museum is Rob Peterson's original Chis Italia and the Alloy Swallow that was at Pebble Beach sitting side by side with each other over there. This is one of the 25 bodies right here. When they were originally built, they were designed basically, everyone built them different. There was one story of someone taking a Duesenberg 12, cutting it in half and powering it. These have been at the Bonneville Salt Flats to do speed trials. I think the fastest one ever was 167 it went. Jaguar engines, whatnot. But the concept of selling them was to go on an MGTD chassis. So for all the British Car Club guys out there, this is classic racing, right? They get the MGTDs, America went racing with them, they pulled the bodies off, and every form of body would go on top of it. 1600 or 1800? So that is the, that is the TD2, that is the 1270. Five that we are going to be punching out to 1500. So we're going to be race prepping this engine with a blower, uh, H4 SU, uh, stroked crank, and this thing is going to be an absolute monster. Uh, 140 to 160 horsepower coming out of this engine when we're done. Cross, uh, cross blow head or alloy lay the alloy head the, uh, the with the large valves the lake. Um, like, like thank you. Yep. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, lay stall. There you go. Um, so uh, this vehicle uh, was designed to help people build them on the MGTD chassis. We went and we found, my client found the body, called me up and says, what do you think about this? I flipped that, I said, buy it immediately. We then went ahead and found a matching numbers chassis and we're building this as if we were back in 51. So the parts, the technology, the concepts that we're using to build this car, it's as if we were back in 52, 53, going ahead and building this car. What you're seeing right now is the beginnings of that. Inside, we're starting to do some of the framework on there, some of the chassis stuff. Um, you'll see this thing within a year, uh, this car being uh, built. Really, really cool car, unbelievable piece of history. Uh, over here is another Cooper race car. Um, this is a Cooper T14. Uh, remarkable, one-off race car, a single-seater, well, a two-seater, but, um, sorry, cycle fender. Uh, remarkable piece of machinery. Of all the cars that we've seen here, this car probably has the most extensive race history. So when you think about it, and we all love our history with these cars, you're looking at a battle-hardened war veteran. This car has raced Prescott, it has raced Grants, it has raced Silverstone, it has raced the Millimiglia. So imagine again doing the Millimiglia in this open cockpit cycle fendered car. Uh, banged and bashed and coming back for more wins and places and overseas and here in America, a remarkable piece of British racing history, of Cooper racing history. And we are building this car and hoping to have her accepted for Amelia Island 2022. So this car will be on the field in 2022, hoping that the selection committee accepts this vehicle uh, for inclusion on the field at that time. Now you mentioned upstairs <clears throat> that you always are doing a balance between uh, period correct and uh, modernization of things. And I'm noticing that it's a single uh, 
cylinder, uh, master cylinder on mm -hmm. this car. Yeah. Is that one of the decisions that you have to make in terms of, and it might be different for uh, a show car that might be driven versus uh, a, a, a period correct restoration for a race car. How, how, do, you, how do you make that decision? Uh, you nailed it, and that is, it goes decision by decision, but the instance you, or the reference you just made, single to maybe more safety with dual, on a car like this, we would never go dual. This is an, an important part of his history that is too dramatic of a change. And the way that these cars are driven, it's not like he's gonna be going to get the groceries with his kids in it. So for the few track days, for Monterey Historics, uh, for potentially shipping it overseas to Silverstone, the single master cylinder will be just fine. Uh, how about for the Ferrari upstairs? Or, no, or that's, that's correct. That's concourse. That's going to be... That's yeah, forensic. Right. So they, we're looking at two cars that are nut and bolt exactly correct. Right. Now, the Daytona, there's a remarkable amount of... Sorry if you hear that noise in the background. The world's around us here. Uh, that is a well-documented vehicle. There's no option. Every nut and bolt is known on that vehicle. When you're dealing with something like this, this is a one-off. This car's had two or three different bodies on it, two or three different noses on it, multiple engines in it. This is a race... Oh no, I think the engine's original in this car. It's the nose, this is a remarkable, but we've done a lot of race cars where the engines have been changed depending upon the races. They, they would swap off cycle fenders and put on full bodies depending upon the race circuit. Lights on the front, if it was a midnight race, they would have one seat or two seats, right? So what's correct? So basically you, you pick a moment in time. In some instances it tells you the most famous race it won or when a famous race car driver was in that cockpit, we choose that point in time. Uh, Sometimes it's a client favorite. It's all correct. So the first nose that was on it, I liked, but the second nose that erased the first millimiglia it ever did, I like better. So we'll do that. So that's where you make some of those scientific changes, so to speak. But in terms of hot rodding or customizing, that's a strong word. There are some adjustments that are made, like putting coating on the panels so that the car doesn't react. Metal is modernization, but it's just respectful for the car. No one will ever see it. It doesn't affect the way the car behaves. When the car is trimmed and painted, those coatings are completely hidden underneath. But we put the linen there anyway, because that is something that can be seen. You, so well, I, these decisions I, I are made. Answer your question, when you did yeah. The first, uh, what was it, uh, yes and Mark? Yeah. Yeah. And I was going to answer it up there, but then you answered it down here by saying we found a technology that would allow us to keep it factory correct. But still not destroy the car like the, like what happened when they initially did it. Um, we'll, we'll consult with clients. So if a client says, I, for instance, if, if if our client with this car now he's a deep, very knowledgeable car person, so he wouldn't have that conversation with me. But if he said, you know, I'm thinking of putting a dual master cylinder on my race car, I would say, let's talk about this. I'm not sure. Or let's build it the the forensic way first. Let's show it at a number of events, bring it to the public, put it into the history books, and then if you want to drive it more, you want to track it, and you, you really want to be safer, we'll then convert it at that point, removing the parts, putting them in a box, not affecting the car, putting a dual master on it, racing it, and then when he's done doing what he wants to do, we can put the single back together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, last, last question. Can you spend a moment with one of my favorites from the 60s, Jim Clark, because he was really involved, especially at Indianapolis 500. I remember the snide remarks by the uh, commentators about uh, a rear-engined uh, car showing up at Indianapolis. So Jim Clark, I mean, the, to give you an example of some of the cars we've spoken about here today, Jim Clark, uh, Phil Hill, uh, my goodness, Remington from the Cobra world, he was involved with... My goodness, my brain is spinning. We got a lot of stuff we've been talking about today. But those names, these famous, iconic names, all had connections to cars that you see here today. Uh, I mean, even Brock Yates, think about the Daytona. Oh my I mean, famous from Cannonball, right? So, you know, I, I never once exceeded 175 miles an hour, the most famous quote of racing history, right? So, uh, I mean, Phil Hill, uh, Sterling Moss, excuse me, cut his teeth in Formula 3 in Cooper Bobtails. Jack Brayman won championships in Cooper Bobtails. You know, uh, the Maserati birdcage, the triangulation of its chassis was, was evolved from the car that we're about to look at right now. So we're, we're talking about some of the most, I mean, I get goosebumps kind of stuff, right? This is the most famous connections, you know, like the, the, the coaching trees in football that spread out in our car community. 
and we're so privileged and honored to have these cars amongst us and we get to play with these things and then build these things correctly and have our clients that support us as we build these cars for them, bringing them to the show field. So when we're out on the show field and we're showing these cars off and people come up to us, this is our moment to share all this incredible history, all the hard work, all the hours, the late night hours, the Saturday mornings when we're here working on these cars of what we go through to make sure that that single master cylinder is the single master cylinder that they raced with back in 1955. Straight out of a Morris Minor. Straight out of a Morris Minor. But this is, that's, you know, because this is all post-war scrounging for parts. What engine are you going to put in this? This is a, this is a 15, the 1500s in that car. This is a Coventry Climax. Oh, wow. The, the old, old Godiva, Godiva. The old Godiva fire pump engine, yeah. which is very, very famous. And that's the same thing that's in the Cooper Bobtail. So, again, this is all part of kind of transporting yourself in history. Uh, post-war, scavenging for parts peeling aluminum off of down Spitfire aircrafts and rehammering it into the shape of race cars, pulling Fiat Topolino front suspensions out, BMC components out, fire pump engines, and putting into the cars. I'm done building tanks, I'm done building bombs, please let me go be car builders again, and we're touching those pieces of history. It's unbelievable, it's so much fun. Quickly behind you is a wonderful chaperone bodied Citroën for folks who love their French crazy cars, one of my favorites, hydraulic everything, and chaperone body, one of the rare Citroëns built out there, Cabriolet. Yeah. We had a, uh, a member of the uh, British Car Club, he had a TC, and that was the car that Shelby took his driver's, his racing driver's <laughs> license in. Awesome. And, it, and he had it completely restored. Yeah. He's, he's lived in Texas, but he used to come out here for the winters. I don't yeah. know if you ever remember, it was a red, a red TC. Uh, where's Dave? How are we doing on time? Unbelievable, right? Right on time. So we're going to walk up to the dyno area, talk about the Lotus, and then we'll open up to any questions, or we're kind of we're doing good for a Saturday morning, OK? So let's, we can go back in, because that's a little precarious over there, and come back in and through. And of course, not to, we're talking about a lot of foreign cars, because that's what this is, a, this is founded from the British car group, but we've got wonderful other stuff here, the Corvettes, and, and we have this incredible Mustang, which we're going to be building a traditional style, real custom car out of. We've got a six pack of Webers going down the middle of the, of the engine that we're building right now. Really, really cool car you're gonna see as well. This is the metal shop. This again, where the Porsche 914.6 was on Friday. We rolled into the booth. It's gonna be coming back here again tomorrow, uh, excuse me, on Monday. But here you see which we have our metal shop. Uh, all of our metal work happens in here. Uh, and again, you can see the very famous English wheel, a real cast iron one, and all the basic tools. Yes, we still actually make wet metal frames and wood bucks and hammer things with mallets into sandbags. Um, all the fun stuff that you see, it all happens in a place like this. Just watch your step coming up the stairs, especially with the dog, and you're going to have a great view when you come up here of this car. So what we just walked by um, is uh, a Lotus Mark 8. This is Colin Chapman's developmental race car from 1953 that basically revolutionized the way chassis were built in the racing world. Uh, working with a couple of aeronautical engineer friends of his, uh, of I told you, right? You're gonna. For, we have a Lotus uh, friend here that I kind of told him. We, I think he's going to enjoy the last stop of the tour here. Um, Colin Chapman is another one of these iconic names in racing history. One of the most prolific, non-trained engineers of of pushing the envelope of race car design through his tenure with Lotus. Uh, this car is a, is another one of these milestone type of cars. In this instance, because of its chassis. This was the first fully space frame triangulated chassis, which again evolved into what we know as the birdcage, which is basically steel tubes triangulated to create an incredibly rigid chassis. 35 pounds, 19 members only, and you've got a race car chassis. One of its claims to fame was the chassis was built in such a way, in such a compact, again, engineered way, that you can't remove the engine without disassembling it. So if you had to work on the engine, you had to disassemble the engine and pull it out part by part, do whatever you need to do with it, and then put it back together in the chassis as you were building it. Uh, they built nine of these. I believe there's eight known, or, and then six left on the road, whatnot. But I'll tell you just kind of again from a history perspective. This is the first time this car has ever been in the United States, and probably the first time this car has been seen in public. 
um, or at least for view, in maybe 30 years. This was acquired by a collector in Europe. It was in a garage or in his collection for years and years and years. He got older, it was never brought out, and it was just purchased by my client, brought to us, and we're sitting here prepping it and bringing it back up on, alive, um, potentially for Amelia Island this year as well. Uh, our client has two cars. He's making a decision whether it's going to go to Amelia this year or next year, but one way or another, you will see this car at Amelia Island either in 21 or in 22. But again, this is one of the most iconic engineering milestone race cars of all time. And if you go in, you'll see the triangulation of the chassis. Remarkable piece of machinery. And again, just even looking at the thing, its presence with the fins and the wings, I've heard more people call this thing the Mach 5 Speed Race than you can imagine. I understand why. Um, we actually took it out last weekend with my client's approval to an event here on Las Olas Boulevard in celebration of Veterans Day called Exotics on Las Olas. And I had the distinct pleasure of taking it for one of its first real long test drives. I drove it from our facility to downtown Fort Lauderdale. Um, and I can tell you it's, um, uh, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was very special for me. Uh, number one, because I'm sitting in a seat that was raced in back all those years ago. But if you've never driven in a car like this before, it gives you an all new appreciation of what these men went through back then. Uh, you know, we talk about seatbelts, we talk about safety, we talk about uh, crash and, and, and safety and crumple zones. Uh, you are completely and totally exposed. Everything rattles. Heat pours through the firewall. Firewall. It's a piece of aluminum. I, I like to drive barefoot. Um, I like to feel the pedals. I don't like the feeling of shoes on my thing. When, you, when your heels touch the, 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 the aluminum floors, they sear because the metal gets so hot from the exhaust, so you have to keep your feet off the ground. Um, it is squirrely. This car wants to be doing 120 miles an hour going on turns. You try to keep this thing straight, and you blink to the right. The car goes to the right, so you are constantly adjusting. And I'm sitting here driving this thing at 60 miles an hour it, with full attention, thinking to myself, the last time this car was driven at speed was at Silverstone with a man and his entire career at stake doing 140 miles an hour knowing that the guy who was in the car next to him, you know, their lives are at stake. Might have, might have died the week before, or might, be, might, might have died the week after. This is during that era where we know, unfortunately, drivers were not really, they were almost I, considered to be disposable in, in a horrible sort of sense. So um, it's very raw. And I've driven in incredible sports cars where you have drive shafts going between your legs or the fuel tank is actually formed around the seat. So it really does give you a new perspective of how, how passionate, how brave, how on the edge these guys were as they raced the glory. And respectfully so, this is the reason why their names have carried forward for all these years. Yeah. Right? That's, that's a tough character right there, it's right? Really it's incredible. What engine is this car? This is the 1500. So that's a 1500, and it's, it's specially built. So it's, uh, it's got a pretty aggressive cram, cam in there, special porting, but it is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's the 1500 in there. So, uh, and it's fast. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, I mean, you know, for us, I, all of us in the British world, you know, it's, it's small displacement. So, you know, a bear will kill you with horsepower, a badger will mess you up pretty bad with small displacements. So these are badger engines. These are snappy, they're quick, they're responsive. These cars are, we put this thing on the scales and we tune the suspension to get this thing driving straight, 1,200 pounds. You can steer this thing with your hips. So when you're going around corners, you just kind of move into it and the whole car comes around with you. It's, it's a full body experience. Just a short drive up there, I, you know, hot and sweaty and feet were burning and noise. You could see the exhaust pipes coming out of the side. It's, it's, uh, it's a full body experience. Um, she's ready to go. So we'll be shipping it up to our client in a couple of weeks. And then hopefully we'll see her on the field of Amelia um, come March. A little what? So, you know, it's really interesting. Yes, there are nicks all over the thing. Um, in this instance, we're not restoring this car. This is the patina, the cracks in the paint, the vibrations and all the panel fit. They will remain for now. My client wants the car in its current condition as it was stored for 25 years in Europe. And then maybe at some point, we'll go through the car and make it very pretty. But for now, in this instance, this is not a Concours restoration. This is not a restoration. This is a 
a wonderful old maintained, not original paint, but maintained maybe 30 year old paint race car that has been in a collection for a long time. So right now it's about mechanics. At some point in the future, maybe we'll make her prettier. So in an American journey, this, this is not a trailer. This is a driver, in American jargon. This is a driver. This is a driver, Lotus Mark 8, one of nine, Colin Chapman, milestone race car. Absolutely. Let's that's hit the track. Trip. Let's go. Well, that's the full tour. And uh, I hope, uh, I mean, I mean, how do you do closing remarks on something like this? This is kind of fun. I, well, okay, let's do it like this. Uh, I hope people had an enjoyment, enjoying time coming through with us. Sorry we couldn't do this in person. Maybe with vaccines going out there and a little bit more control of this stuff, we'll do something in the new year in person. But the ability to share some of our projects, some of our deadlines, some of the stress we've got, hoping that some of the people that are watching and with us will see us on the field at Amelia, at Quail, at Cavallino, um, so we can enjoy these cars together um, is, is ultimately our goal. From Michael's perspective, Mike, if you want to come on over here, really what this was about was bringing the British car community together and our ability to um, connect from Florida with the rest of the country and their respective clubs and share a lot of the British cars that are here with us today was ultimately the goal. And I, I can only hope that we accomplish some of that here today. So, Are, there, uh, are we getting any uh, questions from online? Oh, I don't know. I don't even know, can we do that? Anybody around the country have a question? Control crew, is, are we able, is anybody actually able to communicate with us? Is there any questions that might be getting asked or thoughts? Okay, so before we sign off, if there's anything that anybody out there wants to see, or if they have any questions about something that we spoke about, uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. I would just like to say on behalf of Gold Coast, and for the British car guys across the nation that are tuned in, thank you very much. Oh, my pleasure. It's always great to see you. It's always great to have you guys here with us. So the best things that I think we were able to jump in and create and, and share and uh, and promote the British cars around the nation. So keep on driving. <laughs> Happy motoring, guys. Thank you very much. Enjoy your Saturday. Hang in there. Stay tough. And we'll see you uh, uh, in 21 live on the show fields. Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. So don't sign off just yet. What do we got? Yeah, yep, yeah, come on. Awesome. One question, can you fire up the Lotus so people can hear it? Maybe we could do that. Yeah, yeah. So to the South Florida Jaguar Club, my pleasure. Miss you guys. Can't wait to see you again in the new year, right? And start up the Lotus? Yeah. Going yeah. Okay. okay. So, great question on the electric car thing. It connects directly to what we're speaking about down there. We, as a car community, have a strong history of personalizing and customizing our cars, right? We can't help ourselves. That is part of our culture. So, if someone wants to take a car and do something to it, in this instance, change an engine, put electric power in it, I'm all for it. Where I, where I, draw the line a little bit, where, where I kind of would, if my opinion would say yes versus no, is based upon the, the historical significance or the rarity of the vehicle. If someone's taking one of the 1,400 Aston Martins or 1,700 Aston Martins that were ever built and converting it over, I don't know. But for instance, a Jaguar E-Type, as wonderful and as coveted those vehicles were, they built a lot of those. And they were revolutionary when they were, when they were unveiled at the Earl's Court in 61, right? So if they were a design revolution back then, why not take one and create another design revolution right now with electric power? So I believe in the personalization of vehicles. I believe in having fun and pushing the envelope going forward. But I also respect history. So it's, I, for me, it's never change for change sake. And I always respect the historical significance of some, and the significance of some of these cars. So uh, choose your customizations based upon the situation, um, but I'm all for it. And as a guy who's built an electric vehicle, an antique brass arrow electric vehicle for New York City, um, I have, uh, I've gone that path before. We coach built an all electric e-carriage for Central Park as part of the initiative to transition horses away from tourism and something nostalgic to replace it. And we basically forensically recreated a 
sort of a hybrid between a brass arrow Pierce Arrow and a Rolls Royce with full lithium electric power, including uh, diamond tufted seats and original wood framing and aluminum stretched around it. And it was quite an endeavor. And the car still exists up in New York City to this day. It's a pretty cool piece of machinery, but fully electric. Building an electric mini right now. The yeah, converter. converter. Yeah, they, yep. they put in the engine in the back in uh, South Carolina. They sell a frame for it, where you cut the hole back out of the mini. And that yeah. whole system goes. And up that in whole it. system goes in inside it. of it, and then they, they put the electric. Uh, you couldn't think of a better car to convert than the mini. It's perfect from a weight perspective. It's compact. It's kind of meant as that zip around little vehicle. They build plenty of them, so you can have fun. You can. So it's a it's a perfect um, candidate for that type of conversion. Right. So that when they need a little boost at the red light, all they got to do is push a button, yeah. and the guy next door to him wonders what just happened. S you know, channel your inner Citroën Du Chevaux Safari with the two engines, right? That you make from the rear and the butt. Right. You know, absolutely. There's a uh, company in England that does it on the Motor Trend Channel. Uh, there's a company in England that, that does conversions like that. They did a midget. They did a mini. They did a. Uh, uh, Didn't they do an E-Type as well? Oh, I've seen yeah. articles about they, these guys. Yeah, they, I've been a fan of that also. Yeah. And, um, well, you know, the famous E-Type electric conversion was for the Duke of Windsor, you know, for the, for the royal wedding. Yeah. They drove it from their stables, and it was an electric E-Type. You know, I think that was, that was done by Eagle, which is a famous Jaguar customizer over in the UK. So. Yeah, they, they, they've done a Ferrari. They've, they've done, done two, two like, of the, the 308 series, series uh, from, from different, different British people. people. Uh, they also, there's a, a gentleman in England that is reproducing the, um, the Porsche Speedster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he tried to get involved with them to electrify any of those replicas uh, that he did. Um, they've, done, they've done a lot of, they did a BMW 2000 series. Listen, I think I speak for all of us, and that is there is never going to be a replacement for high octane fuel burning in our noses. But, you know. A little electric power here or there, some conversions over there. I mean, if you're going to do it, have fun with it. Because um, 10 years from now, it'll be hydrogen power. Well, you know? You know? My so. grandchildren talk about my, my personal hot rod, and they say it's stinky. Oh, God, the bathe in 104 octane exhaust well, note. Yeah, but their perspective is totally why, why don't you do like Dad with the Tesla? Why is this stinky? <laughs> it's a different era, kid. What you need to do is you need to put them in a car, take them around a track. Have them feel G's and a big displacement engine or a small displacement engine open exhaust permeate through their body and see how they react when they get out of the car and then ask them about electric cars after that. They have no association with why we love our engines. If you give them, because right now they get in a car, I've never looked under the hood of my LR4. I don't know what's underneath there. I don't care. It gets me to work every single day. So they don't know what we know. Put them in a car. Have them feel exhaust. Have them feel vibration. Have them understand what it's like to have a big block engine wear you down just from the energy it's putting through the vehicle, all of a sudden they understand what machinery is, that connection that we have with machinery. They don't have that association right now. Do that. Then get them out of the car and say, so now what do you like? They're like, whoa. Yeah. Like, we're, we're, it's easy, it's yeah. it's down. Yep. Take them down the highway. And take them down the highway. Because it's a combination of fear and excitement and energy and control and a stick shift in their hands, right? Train them how to stick on the, you know, on the column. I got trained how to drive a stick shift, three on the tree. Awesome. I'm in control of that machine. I need to speak to that machine. That machine needs to speak to me. Totally different than on their phone with a car that, you know, if the temperature control is off by one degree, they get hot and they get complaining. So it's, it's up to us, right? This is why we do this stuff. It's up to us to ensure that they at least understand and appreciate really what this is about. Yes. How does the thickness of the Lotus fiberglass compare to an early Corvette? Thickness of the Lotus fiberglass. That's an alloy. This is an alloy car. An alloy car. So all the the Lotuses here are all alloy. Okay. Um, and in terms of the thicknesses of fiberglass, or the, like for instance, the uh, alloy Swallow, which is in the back. Um, okay. So all of the cars here are aluminum or steel. Um, the Lotuses, the Cooper Bobtail, the Cooper um, NTO 650, the T14, the Lotus Mark 8, 
These are alloy cars. These are all hand-formed alloy cars. The alloy Swallow is fiberglass. The Corvettes, as we all know, they're all fiberglass as well. Um, the Allied Swallow, which is a hand-built, laid fiberglass car, is certainly more fragile or a little more precarious than the production Corvette cars, which are reinforced, which have structural mounting points in them. So the Corvettes and or US-built production cars certainly are thicker and more structurally sound. Um, for race car guys, when fiberglass was really first introduced to the world, basically in 51, 52, Corvette made it famous in 55, um, this was an experiment in technology. And um, the racing community embraced it with Devon body cars. So a lot of race car guys, SCCA guys, would know the Devon body cars, very, very famous. You would get TDs, you would get Alphas, you'd get anything you could find, custom chassis, buy a Devon body race body shell and put it on there and go racing. So the Allied Swallow is, in a way, part of that Devon bodied race car um, uh, experiment, so to speak. Uh, they were thin. These bodies were not meant for production. They didn't have a warranty attached to them. No one expected them to last. So these things were thin. They were fragile. I don't know, you know, they would crack regularly and be repaired regularly. So they, they're, they're fiberglass, but they're almost different animals. Production versus handmade racing kind of ideas. Anything else? Cool. Uh, no, just uh, thank cool. you from the British Car Club of Miami. Awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, just, you know, Excellent. Much you on everything you've been working on. Hey, Marson, when we tried to start up the Lotus the other day, she was, it was just a cold start, or you were having some difficulty with her? Or? Uh, I think the, just from sitting, the battery had gotten a little... Is she charged crazy. up now? She's going to start? Uh, or should I even... It, was, it started yesterday. It should, uh, should fire right up. Okay, let's see what we got. All right, so we're going to give one shot to start up the Lotus. Maybe a little bit of high-octane fuel will get us going here. So this is how you get into a vintage race car, right? So uh, you kind of have to put both feet in at the same time. This car is actually interesting because it's got a rigid back, so you can kind of get yourself braced on here. A lot of these cars, it's too fragile. You can't put your hands back here. And you have to put both. What's that? Yeah, I'm a little bit bigger, right? If you met some of these guys, they're like jockeys, right? Um, and that's always the thing that's interesting about this. One of the first things that my client asked me about after I took her out was, is tell me how you fit because we buy these cars from a history perspective, but I've been in some of these things. The Stangolini we put the Pebble Beach a couple, years ago, a couple years ago, your knees are dug into the dash. It is a very painful experience. So this car is remarkably comfortable. Once you go in, once you go in, you have to put both legs in at the same time. You kind of just slide in, and now you're locked into position. And now here you are. And once you're in, otherwise, other than being tight on the hips, and you kind of can't move, which is a good thing. I'm kind of locked in. It's actually quite comfortable compared to some other of the race cars. So. The trick is probably how to get out. You can never get out. So. <laughs> the ticking of the SU fuel pump, and let's see. Oh, hot pup. No speedometer, just attack and some basic functions. Uh, and off you go. You can feel the thing come alive, and when you sit in it, again, it is basically me held in by aluminum panels and an engine. And um, I can tell you that when you get this thing up to speed, you're sitting here with your head up in the wind scrunching in and completely locked in with this car. My knee is pressed up against one of the chassis members, one of the steel triangulations. My other leg is pressed up against the aluminum tunnel with the exhaust going right by it. I can feel the heat building already. My butt is locked into place between these two panels. And um, no seat belts, no crash bags. Uh, that's it. You're in it and it's either finish, win, or, um, or otherwise, which we don't want to think about. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. One more question. Yeah. Why is he called blue when he's white? 
<laughs> His official name is Tennessee Blue Bear. Blue, I, my, it was my wife's turn to name the dog, and she dreamed growing up of always having a dog named Blue. What did, what did you do the 1500 um, uh, TD. 1500 yeah. mm -hmm. He's a perfect match. Or TF, actually. It's a, the 1500 TF, yeah. Mm -hmm. Blue is a perfect match for the car. Right? Except there's no seat there. Well, there is, actually. You can, you know, it's typical. It's the mechanic seat, so there's a little pocket in there where you can put somebody if you need to, so.